This is the ETH podcast. My name is Jennifer Kakshuri. I'm your host. And in this episode, we are talking about conflicts and how to take steps towards peace. I'm here with two guests. One of them is located in Nairobi and we're connected via Skype. Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Please tell us what you do and where you work. Uh, my name is Kaltuma Hassan Nuro. I am from Kenya. I work with Green String Network. It's an organization that does social healing through the lens of trauma healing. And I oversee the community program in Mombasa. My other guest is here with me at the main building of ETH. So my name is Simon Mason. I work at the Center for Security Studies at the ETH Zurich. And we have a project together with the Swiss Foreign Ministry. It's called a mediation support project where we support the, the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs in their mediation activities through training, research, and working with people in conflict contexts. It's a joint project with Swiss Peace. And so we're very applied in the sense of trying to learn from practitioners what works, what doesn't work, and why. The two of you, Kaltuma and Simon, there's a lot that connects you, but there's one person that actually brought you together. So, yes, the, um, the person who, the reason why we're here really is uh, Deka Ibrahim Abdi. I think she's been an inspiration for many, many, many people. The way she's worked for peace, the way she's lived for peace. In a way, by accident, I bumped into her in a workshop and from the first moment was really fascinated by someone who's lived through violence but does not have hatred and who, who works for peace. And so it was like from that moment, you know, what can we learn? How can we learn to work for peace in this world that definitely needs that kind of attitude of clarity, passion, modesty? It's a very strange mix. So Deka is the mother of Kaltuma and she passed away in a horrible car accident in 2011. Kaltuma, could you describe what your mother was like? What kind of a person she was? That's such a subjective question to ask, and I'm very biased because I will say she was a lovely human being because she was my mom. But she really definitely meant a lot to a lot of people. She really cared deeply about her community um, and people on the street. So she really passed that on to us, her children, to be conscious and to be kind and to be tolerant of every individual. And she showed that through practice, for us especially. Simon, what did Deca mean to you? I think if I, if I try to boil it down, it's something about being able to bring seeming opposites together. And these can be different values, different people, different communities. And bringing, bring, or helping them to bring together in a way that, um, you know, not one is sacrificed against the other. And so for me, it's, it's like the heart of mediation that she, she lived and practiced, where it's not one over the other, be it an idea, a value, or a community, or a person, but somehow there's something very creative if you can bring these, these seeming opposites together in a way that something new is created that's bigger and newer, more full of life than, than it was. And so it's like this, this transforming of conflict, which is it's not one person can do it, but somehow people can come together and in a process through the right structure and, and mindset and, and heart attitude, something really miraculous can happen. Kaltuma, from you I hear that your mother was a very devoted person, that she was very emotional, very generous also in her emotionality and loving. Do you know what drew her to what she did, why she became a peacemaker? I'm sorry, there's an airplane that's passing by. I live near an airport. Um, I don't know what drew her to peace building, per se. I think she was always connected to people. I think she always felt a desire to help people. She was a person who did a lot of acts of service, even outside of her work, even at home. She always gave to people, and she really cared deeply about it. the peace of her home and also just living a good life, you know. Living in an insecure environment is... It's just, I, I, don't, I can't describe that to you. I, I'm so glad I don't live in such an environment anymore. Uh, but however, specifically for her, what drew her in was 
raising us kids. She was pregnant at the time with my brother. I was two years old. She just got fed up with having to hide us underneath a bed, you know, and not be part of the conversation. She knew she had a stake. Um, her voice mattered. And she really used her voice and, and walked the walk, as I said, um, to make sure that if there's going to be sustained peace, that she was a part of it and she was going to make it possible. And from 1991 to this day, Wajir still, the resources are shared equitably, the political power is shared equitably. So it's, it's, and we're still learning a lot from what she does because the work that I'm doing today is influenced heavily by what she has created in Kenya. Simon, what was your key moment to become a peace worker? If that's the correct term, I don't even know. Is it the correct term? Uh, probably not, but it doesn't matter. What would be the correct term? When, when I explain it to my grandmother, who's 100 years old, I say a peace researcher, but I'm uh, hopefully one day also um, putting it into practice. I think for me, the moment was also very much an experience. So I was studying environmental science. I did a PhD in water sharing. And then I heard of a course about mediation. I thought, that sounds cool. I didn't know what it was, and I did the course. But the, the real moment of, of believing the method works was during a mediation I did as part of the training between two people. So it was an interpersonal conflict. And the sensation of it's not me, it's not the one person or the other who unblock this tangle of conflict. But there's a process, there's some kind of a space that's created between us that untangles the misunderstanding and the silence they had stopped talking for half a year. And it's just like an, an unblockage that is a miracle. And so experiencing that miracle, it's, 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 it feels a bit like magic. And it's not me, it's not them, but it's somehow together through this structured process of a mediation that, that is really unbelievable to experience. And building on that to say, well, if it works on the interpersonal level, can it also work on political conflict? And I think since then, basically, my, my research and training and work with people in conflict context is that question, how can it work also with violent political societal conflict? And then learning from Deca is, yes, it can work. So it's again, it's this sensation of there's, there's something very life-firming in mediation and this, this work for peace that is beautiful. You told us that you wrote a book together with Deca, that you started writing the book many years ago and that it only was able to come out just now. Can you tell us how you proceeded, how you worked on the book after Deca passed away? So for maybe one or two years, I didn't. It was like um, emotionally too, it was not, it didn't feel right. And then it was very much that sense of there's so much value and wisdom for the world in, in her approach that it's worth um, bringing out. Somehow the book is, is maybe a dialogue between my more conceptual, maybe a bit more dry academic approach, and her in-depth experience, storytelling, poetic approach. The purpose is to try and say, well, what can the world, and, and here I'm talking a bit about my world, so the Western slightly over-conceptualized world of peacemaking, What can they learn from someone like Decker who struggled, lived in conflict, transformed conflict and had such a unique approach? And so it's like trying to bridge her approach, her world into the academic, this teaching, the, the more dry world. And I think there's, there's a great benefit of trying to bring those together. But of course, it, there was a worry of, of pinning it down too much because there's something very intuitive about the way she worked for peace. But when you want to learn, you have to use some concept. So it's, that, that was for me a challenge. And one way of dealing with it is the some parts are more like a, a framework of how you approach mediation and governance building. And some parts are more or less the, the original interview case studies of what she did, who she worked with, how they reacted, the crisis. And, and someone who read it said it's like um, a mystery story for mediators. And the storytelling for me is the, the beautiful part because you, if you have your concepts, you can read the stories and you just feel what is happening rather than, you know, over ma making it too abstract. And so this, for me, that's the beauty of the book is, is the, the wisdom and, and sharing it with the world. 
and trying to bring this more poetic storytelling uh, arts or spiritual approach and some conceptual framework that I think can be helpful if you're starting work or you want to organize you yourself mentally in, in the work for peace and governance building in these very fragile contexts. What's happening to Deca's legacy? So for me, there's something very special about the person. But in the book project we did together, which was interviewing her for six days and, and drawing from workshops where we worked together, there's always a sense too that it's not just about the person. But there's some message, there's some approach that she lived and used in her work that we can learn from and that we can make our own and adapt. So it's not it's not a copy-paste. And so it's like using the, the inspiration of her approach and her wisdom and her struggle. I think it, it wasn't easy, right? She, she really struggled for, for peace. She struggled working on conflict. It's learning and being inspiring and then making it your own in your daily life, in your family, in your community, in your work. Kaltuma, if I look at my Facebook news feed and my Twitter and if I listen to the radio and look around, then peace seems like something that's really far away on many levels around the world. What keeps you going, nevertheless? What keeps me going? What keeps you going as a person who works for peace? Uh, the community that I work with, uh, the resilient individuals that still push on despite all the traumas and all the pain that they've lived through. I feel like I owe it to us as a people of Kenya because we're regional power in our in East Africa that holds pretty much all the other countries that are surrounding us together. And in 2017, when um, there was a state of relative peace and we didn't know where the country was going to go as far as the election, because we had two elections in one year, I had conversations with Uber drivers that would drop me to work and they would say, they were angry and they would be like, oh, if we don't win this election, we're going to burn the country down and I would ask them, where are you going to be refugees? Because the West is no longer taking people in and countries like Somalia, countries like South Sudan are not places a Kenyan would want to go and live if anything went south. Why is it better to take many small steps towards peace rather than one big one? I think a peace agreement can be great, but also we have to sustain that. And like in Kenya, for example, we always have political reconciliation, but there's always something bubbling in the background. And I think small steps are very necessary to make sure that we attain uh, that sustained peace, that world peace, that peace that we're looking for. So, if, for example, in Kenya, if we don't at this time work to do what I'm doing right now, to have these conversations, to have these dialogues at the grassroots level and also with the police service, Anything can pop off, and I think those small steps are very important, as much as the big steps. This is the ETH podcast. My guests in this episode were Kaltuma Norov, who was connected to us from Nairobi via Skype, and she recorded what she was saying with her smartphone. My other guest was Simon Mason from the Center for Security Studies at ETH. My name is Jennifer Kakshuri. I produced this podcast together with Tis Wachter's Audio Story Lab. Music, mastering and sound design by Luki Fretz. Thank you for listening. You can subscribe to the ETH podcast and always receive the latest episode that we produce for you. <laughs> <laughs>